Ladies and gentlemen, from a catacomb buried deep beneath the streets of the New World Order, this is the Remnant Underground. And now, here's your host, Michael J. Matt. So it was obviously Ash Wednesday when 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz took his little, his little AR-15 and went to school and started shooting the place up. The beginning of Lent, this to me seems somehow significant. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now our nation, as we were all reminded so brutally again this week, our nation has become used to the terrifying reality that many of us will become dust long before our time. You know, kids are becoming dust in classrooms, while millions and millions of unborn babies are becoming dust in the wombs of their own mothers. You've got suicide, you've got terrorism, you've got drug abuse. Ours is a culture covered in the dust of death. Well, you know, sure that the talking heads are all busy now after this latest shooting. They're babbling on and on about gun control and mental health and putting schools you know, in lockdown, making them into virtual prisons, installing metal detectors and everything else. But this is, this is sad, it may be well intended, but these are just going to be band-aids on our, on our severed carotid artery in society today. None of it, in other words, will result in a solution to the problem because it has nothing to do with the cause. And the cause of all of this is America's war on God, America's war on life, on family. These, these poor kids, I mean, think about what they, what they went through. They grew up in a world that says, you know, if a baby, for example, gets in your way, well, kill it. If old people get old and they're suffering, kill them. If life gets a little tough, kill yourself. It's a world where prayer, prayer in school has been replaced by these very strange moments of silence. Nobody says a word about God. Because, well, he's been expelled from school, from their school a half century ago. He's not there anymore. And you see, I, I, I see that as the problem, the underlying problem to all of this. In these schools, there is no God, no Christian morality, no right and wrong. Can't use gender-specific pronouns anymore, kids. Nope, not going to have that. No he and she. We can't do that. We can't use words like mom and dad either, right? Public school administrators, we got to run that out too, just like we ran God out. Got to run the traditional family out of these schools. Our kids are literally growing up in the twilight zone. Little lab rats in laboratories of sexual abuse and sexual experimentation. School administrators and teachers encouraging little kids to change their sex if they become so confused. If they become confused enough by the gender ideology omnipresent now in these dens of iniquity. And then they outlaw therapy for kids who are so abused and so confused by the end of the day at a public school that they end up thinking that maybe it's time to cut off their own private parts. So yeah, you think there might be a few mental health problems in public schools today? Yeah, I think so. Godless, immoral, liberal nutjobs created the problem though. I mean, if you, if you rob kids, if you, <clears throat> if you strip little kids of the normal Christian family, of life, of morality, of religion, of God, and then you subject them to sexual experimentation, and then you pump them full of sexualized and violent music for 24 hours a day, violent video games and twisted movies, what do you think is going to happen to these guys? Where are they supposed to find this moral compass that's going to prevent them from doing whatever they want, including becoming crazy, crazed young people that want to bring AR-15s to school? This isn't to justify them, but it's to, it's to shed a little bit of light on the real cause here. The cause is the schools have become moral-free, God-free zones. And how did they get this way? I would say the answer to the question, how did we find, how did our country arrive at this dismal point where kids are killing kids all over the place every other few weeks? How did we get here? It's because the world's only serious moral authority the Catholic Church surrendered. She has surrendered. Well, here's a case in point. On February 5th, 2018, a man named Deacon Stephen Gradonis, who is a deacon of the Archdiocese of Newark, New Jersey, and a movie critic for the National Catholic Register, released a YouTube video praising the 2017 film Call Me By Your Name, which I have not seen for reasons which will become obvious. This film, have you seen it, Rob? I have not. not seen it, okay. Yeah, I didn't think so. This film celebrates a sexual relationship between an underage boy and an older man. Now, many of you in this audience have probably seen Deacon Steve's review 
uh, which was released as part of a project for the Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn's uh, DeSales Media Group. So it's official Catholic review, in other words. But I'm going to have Rob, th hopefully we can throw it up on the screen here so that we're not accused of taking this man out of context and you can judge for yourself. So I, I want to I make a larger point, not about Deacon Steve personally, because I actually feel kind of sorry for Deacon Steve. He's clueless. But about the state of the new and improved Catholic Church where guys like Deacon Steve get to lead. I'm Stephen Gradanis with my Real Faith review of Call Me By Your Name, director Luca Guadagnino's adaptation of the novel by Andre Osiman from a screenplay by James Ivory about the sexual awakening of a young man in Italy in the early 1980s in a relationship with an older man. Timothy Chalamet plays Elio, a 17-year-old Jewish Italian American whose archaeology professor father invites a graduate student named Oliver, played by Army Hammer, to stay with the family for the summer. The bucolic Italian landscape is exquisite, the meals delectable, the actors attractive and often winsome. This is a film that wants to seduce the viewer. It's not like Brokeback Mountain, a polemic against heteronormativity, nor like Moonlight, a lament for the young victims of toxic masculinity culture. Instead, it's a decadent ode to desire and celebration of male beauty, adorned from the opening credits with images of classical Greco-Roman statuary, a bid with the setting to evoke a pre-Christian classical milieu of sexual liberality, real or imagined. Self-indulgent and wish-fulfilling in the manner of countless heterosexual romance novels and cinematic equivalents, it's also more explicit in the heterosexual encounters than the same-sex ones to avoid alienating too many straight viewers. A closing speech shows that Guadagnino isn't above explicitly summing up the tolerant, seize-the-moment moral, a move as obvious as Chalamet's acting in the last shot is subtle. Deacon Steve has been hammered for this review, rightfully so, uh, which, in my opinion, can be summed up with one word. Ooh. You know what I'm saying, Rob? You know? Mm. I'm not sure what's going on there. I'm not going to pile on. In any case, you saw it. You make your own decision. And in fact, again, I don't want to take him out of context. I want to be fair to this guy, so maybe Rob can throw his, uh, his explanation is up on the screen. You can take a look for yourself. Because uh, this guy is just, you know, he means well. I can see that. But he's just clueless. He's a clueless new Catholic working in a pretty clueless new church, you know, that has positioned itself to the left of even many Protestant denominations when it comes to the culture war. And to make that point, here is how our Protestant brothers review the very same film over at MovieGuide.com. Quote, Call Me By Your Name presumes that it's a profound movie about a homosexual relationship, but it actually shows the roots of pedophilia and lust to the true nature of homosexual perversion and same-sex attraction. Call Me By Your Name confuses lust with love. As such, it is one of the most explicit, abhorrent, mainstream movies of the year, homosexual or heterosexual. Call Me By Your Name is a movie for misguided, agenda-driven people with a warped, confused sense of art and a warped, delusional mind, end quote. So say the Protestants. You see what I'm getting at? Even Protestants now can see that a film like this one needs condemnation from the big people in the room. But this is something that Deacon Steve specifically says is not part of his job description as a Catholic film critic. But see, it used to be certainly used to be the job of the Catholic film critic to tell us when something was dangerous or was immoral or was seductive. This guy comes right out and says, this is a film that wants to seduce us. Well, don't you think you might want to tell people, I wouldn't watch it then, don't come anywhere near it because you might get seduced, right? But no, not for Deacon Steve, because Deacon Steve is a new kind of film critic. He's a new kind of Catholic. He's working for a new kind of Catholic church, going to a new mass, studying a new catechism over the years, working for a new evangelization in a church that has a new orientation. You see, it's all different now. It's all changed. Deacon Steve's also a convert from the Dutch Reformed Church. He was raised Calvinist, and he was an acolyte at some point in his life in the Episcopal Church, kind of been around a little bit. And he finally wound up converting to the Catholic Church not too long ago, in the middle of the worst crisis in the history of the Catholic Church. So you see, I'm not trying to pile on. This poor guy, he really doesn't know what it's all about. 
I honestly believe he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand, you know, why people reacted like they did to his review. He's not ill-willed. He's got seven kids, a father, married man, apparently. He's trying to do the right thing. But see, this is the problem with the neo-Catholics. They're not necessarily malicious, but they just have no Catholic sense anymore. They're what we used to be called the census catholicus. And yet they're being put in positions of leadership most of the time merely because their expertise comes from the fact that they spend most of their life as, as heretics and a heretical sect. And they converted. Now they're experts. Wow! Somebody wants to join our church? Let's make them an expert. Let's give them a title and a position. See, because Deacon and Steve's Catholic critics are probably mostly cradle Catholics. And they can remember just a few years ago when the Catholic Church was leading the charge in condemning immoral and rotten stuff like this. Thus helping millions of people, by the way, avoid being seduced by a movie about a sexual predator. She, this is crazy, is it not? I mean, in the present climate, that any Catholic film critic would even touch this film without first condemning it is proof that these people are living in another reality. You heard of Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood there, Deacon Steve? How about Archbishop Barros in Chile? Sex offenders, sex scandals everywhere in the church, in, in the news all around today. In the middle of all that, the Archdiocese of Newark says, Hey, let's get Deacon Steve to review this new film about a sexual predator. Holy cow! Have they lost their minds? No, they haven't. They have a complete new orientation. That's the problem. They have a completely opposite response to immorality than the church did just 50 years ago. Now you can say it's time for the church to grow up and it's time for the church to become sensitive and sophisticated and blah, blah, blah. But don't for one second pretend like this doesn't represent a complete seismic change in the Catholic church. In fact, let's, let's, let's engage in just a little trivia. Do you remember the old actor, you know, Carl Malden, Rob? For Carl? Pollyanna. Kind of a big Pollyanna. On the waterfront. Yeah, on the waterfront, that's the guy. Well, which one of his many films would you say he considered his favorite? Would it be Patton or Pollyanna or On the Waterfront? Do you have any idea? No. No, of course not. I didn't either. Because the film that was Carl Malden's favorite is a little-known 1956 film directed by Hollywood heavyweight Ilya Kazan, and it's called Baby Doll. Ever heard of it? I hadn't heard of it. Baby Doll. Now, in the film, Malden, Carl Malden, plays a seedy character whose young and voluptuous wife, Baby Doll, played by actress Carol Baker, denies him the marital privilege. Now, at the time, there were few Hollywood directors bigger than Ilya Kazan, okay? The screenplay for Baby Doll was based on a play by the renowned playwright, Tennessee Williams. Mm. It's big-time stuff. Lead actor Carl Malden had created a sensation just two years earlier with his stirring portrayal of a Catholic priest in the film On the Waterfront. And Carol Baker was Hollywood's newest sex symbol. She was 1956's Talk of Tinseltown. Okay? So everything about Baby Doll, in other words, positively screamed blockbuster. Yet Robin knows a lot about movies and never heard of it. I had never heard of it. And why do you suppose that is? Why did so, people, so few people see the movie Baby Doll? It's because when the movie was released, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, Francis Spellman, condemned it. In fact, he issued a statement making it very clear in no uncertain terms that as far as the Catholic Church was concerned, seeing the movie would constitute a mortal sin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the end of Baby Doll. The film that would have given Marnie a run for its money at the Academy Awards fell into obscurity because the Catholic Church said, no, you're not getting away with that. So ask yourselves, hey, I'm not trying to, again, I was, I'm trying to be prudish down here. Just ask yourself, what happened? Who was right in, in, in that outlook or that sort of decision in, in, in dealing with the culture question? Was the church so closed-minded and puritanical back then as to just, for us to just laugh at it? They were out of touch, they were goofy. Or has the church today simply lost all sight of her own mission? of her own purpose. Now, Rob and I are coming to you from a catacomb in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, right? Well, do you want to know what the Archbishop of St. Paul, the great John Gregory Murray, had to say about the motion picture industry back in, on August 28, 1934, some 84, 85 years ago? 
He issued a directive asking Catholics in our archdiocese at that time to make a pledge of resistance to the Hollywood of those days, the movies of those days. And it's interesting. It's an interesting bit of history to consider. And that's all I'm asking you to do. Consider the way it used to be. Consider the way it is now. And ask yourself, I wonder which is better for a moral, for a religious institution like the Catholic Church. So here, here's, what Car here's what Archbishop Murray said, quote, By his pledge, as well as by the law of his own conscience, every Catholic is obliged to withdraw immediately from any place of entertainment as soon as he is aware of a portrayal of any scene, character, or personality whose influence he would judge to be unwholesome for any person of any age, even a child, who may be admitted to the theater or place of entertainment. Moreover, having discovered that such entertainment is permitted in such theater or place, he binds himself not to return to that place or theater at any time in the future until he learns on the authority of those who are responsible witnesses that all programs of such a nature have been eliminated from such theater for all future time as a matter of policy by the management of the theater or of the place of entertainment. In other words, he must withdraw subsidy in the form of patronage from such a place as long as it may be an occasion of sin to any person, end quote. How about that, Rob? Mm. <laughs> that, that's what they were saying 80 years ago. Again, you can say that they were a little, little prudy, a little puritan if you want. But don't try to tell me that things haven't changed dramatically. When's the last time you heard any bishop talk about the problem with movies? Even priests hardly touch it anymore. Right? They don't say anything. They talk about Jesus and they talk about the scripture and mission and all of this stuff. But they never talk about sin. They never talk about being wary of things that might actually ensnare our souls. Right? Well, just ask yourself, why is that? Why have they abandoned all that talk? All those warnings, which is kind of what their job was, right? As Holy Mother Church to make sure we were all on the stay and on the straight and narrow, right? Well, this was, this was 1934, not 1534. Yeah, but our critics, and probably in, in, including Deacon Steve, they're going to say, but that was the fortress mentality of the old church. We had to get rid of that. Vatican II got rid of that because she didn't know how to reach out and love the world. The world didn't have any idea what the church was all about back in those days. Well, really? You really know that? You critics of the church? Are you so sure of that? This is, this, this is why Catholic missionaries at the time were all, literally, all over the world making converts by the millions because she didn't know how to reach out and love the people? Really? Again, this is 20th century we're talking. Even Hollywood in the 20th century understood the Catholic church in those years, as we've mentioned before down here. Remember all those Catholic movies featuring Hollywood A-listers? Such as Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Montgomery Clift, Gregory Peck, Carl Malden, and on and on it goes. Respectfully playing Catholic priests in Hollywood blockbusters. You remember that? You remember Ingrid Bergman, Rosalind Russell, Haley Mills, Jennifer Jones playing nuns, beautiful Catholic nuns, you remember? Playing St. Bernadette, playing St. Joan of Arc, remember all of that? My kids still watch those movies, they're beautiful. That's what Hollywood was doing back in the days when the Catholic Church was so fortress mentality and no one wanted anything to do with it because they were afraid and she didn't know how to love it. Are you kidding me? The world respected our church as a worldwide missionary powerhouse with soup kitchens, orphanages, hospitals, and churches all over the world, most of which have now been shuttered and closed down or sold off since Vatican II. And the church was a moral authority, even Hollywood had to try to placate back in those years. Because she was an authority. Because she, when she spoke, people listened. Millions of people listened. Back when the pews, the Catholic pews on Sunday morning in church were full. Standing room only, four or five, six masses and churches all over the place before they started shutting them all down, remember? They had to build those churches. Why? Because there were so many people. So many Catholics, not only cradle Catholics, but people flocking to convert to the Catholic Church. Vocations, remember, through the roof. So how dare these new Catholics, which now sit in their thrones overseeing the worst pre-sex scandal in the history of the Church, as well as a vocations crisis 
mass church closings all over the place, all-time low mass attendance numbers, how dare they criticize the Catholic Church of the past, of the recent past, which even Pope John XXIII, when he opened the Second Vatican Council, admitted that that church, the church of that time, was healthy, was vibrant, there were no problems, remember it was a pastoral council, and he didn't want to hear anything from the prophets of doom to the contrary. Remember, it was all good. So don't tell me the Vatican II was called in order to address the problems of the day. The problems of the day where there weren't enough pews, there weren't enough seminaries, there weren't enough convents. There weren't enough Catholic schools to accommodate the demand. That's how it really was. Well, the church in those years, did it have problems? Of course it did. The church has had problems. It's a human institution as well as a divine. And great saints such as Pius X never ceased warning us, warning the church of the attempted in inf infiltration of modernism and modernists who eventually did take control of the church after Vatican II. But the church at that time still knew very well what her role was in those preconciliar years. She knew her enemy and she actively opposed him while she fed and educated the, the children of the world at the same time. Somehow she managed to do both. In 1936, another example, the great Pope Pius XI issued an encyclical letter called Vigilante Cura on the motion picture industry itself. Deacon Gradonis, perhaps you should read it. Because in there, Pius XI writes, quote, Everyone knows what damage is done to the soul by bad motion pictures. They are occasions of sin. They seduce young people along the ways of evil by glorifying the passions. They show life under a false light. They cloud ideals. They destroy pure love, respect for marriage, affection for the family. It is the duty of the bishops of the entire Catholic world to unite in vigilance over this universal and potent form of entertainment and instruction to the end that they may be able to place a ban on bad motion pictures because they are an offense to the moral and religious sentiments and because they are in opposition to the Christian spirit and to its ethical principles." End quote. So the way I see this is that we really have only two ways of looking at what's going on. Either the hierarchy before the council were wrong, they were just a gaggle of puritanical nutters, or they were absolutely right, and we're the ones who've gone over, to, over the cliff, lost our bearings, we're the ones who are ceasing to be Catholic, we are the nutters, which is possible. It's at least possible. Because Vatican II, remember, threw open the windows to the modern world. It ended medieval triumphalism. It made the Pope a man of the people. It tore out the communion rails, got rid of the altar, tipped over most of the statues and gave us a Protestant liturgy in the process of transforming our church into a new church of accompaniment. The church of accompaniment. Where God's law was swapped for tolerance and inclusivity. Remember, before Vatican II, even Hollywood understood. Even Hollywood could not deny that the Catholic Church was the arch nemesis of evil. In the movies, there was only one religion that was ever depicted as having priests that had the power to drive out the evil spirits. Remember, it was always Catholic priests who were summoned to the bedsides of the, of the possessed. Even for the world in the mid-20th century, in other words, the Catholic Church was still the exorcist. With an army of priests at her beck and call, she had the power to send the world's demons hurling over the cliffs. Entertainment giants like Ilya Kazan and the rest, they had to stand down at the command of the Roman Catholic Church with her strong and vibrant parishes in every city in America and a veritable flotilla of Catholic schools that were the high water mark of education in this country before Vatican II. That was then. Today the ultimate exorcist has silenced herself, abandoned her Latin formulae, so terrifying to demons, and mangled her own prayers, her own liturgy. This isn't my opinion. Go compare the old form of baptism, for example, to the new one. They've removed the exorcisms. Instead of driving out demons, the Catholic Church of today is dialoguing with them and reviewing their little stupid films. And in the absence of the great exorcist, outright evil is triumphing throughout the whole world. Why? Because the Church is the mystical body of Christ, and without Christ, without his visible church, without his voice in society, without his law, there's only chaos and more chaos, and that's what we're seeing 
everywhere, every week now in the news. And what to do? Wake up. Wake up. Wake your family and friends and neighbors to what's happened to the church. Join the worldwide movement to restore the Catholic Church. Join the traditional Catholic resistance and help make the Catholic Church Catholic again before the evil ones dominate every single aspect of our lives. I'm Michael Matt for The Remnant Underground, and we'll see you next week.